line, we learn the proper method to trim a hedge. The hedge should always be wider at the base than it is at the top. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications. Welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we travel to Rapid City and visit with Extension Horticulture Educator Rick Abrahamson. Rick demonstrates how, to, how cuttings are used to propagate plants. And as always, our panel of lawn and garden experts are here to answer your questions with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden related concerns. So get ready to call in. The phone number for you to call is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Joining me in the studio to answer your questions is John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist, Chris Therasso, Minnehaha County Extension Horticulture Educator, Connie Tandy, SDSU Plant Diagnostic Lab, and Mike Meckning, Extension Weed Specialist. Helping answer the phones tonight are the folks from the Minnehaha Master Gardeners. And remember, when you call in with your questions, please provide your phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, whether it's affecting any other surrounding plants and moisture and soil conditions that exist. First off, however, we're going to go around the table to hear from our panelists on what is currently happening, starting with you, John Ball. What do we have in the tree world that's uh, happening this past week? Well, I think we're on day 38 of that 40-day flood. Okay. Uh, you know, for me tonight, it's just talking a little bit more about flooding. Uh, you know, people have obviously got some very serious concerns with their homes and that, uh, Dakota Dunes and Pier and a number of other areas. But one of the things I do want to remind people is we are going to see a lot of damage with trees probably over the next uh, next couple of weeks and in the fall. I'm already seeing some trees turning color. So um, unfortunately, uh, when people are able to get back to their homes and maybe do a little repair on that, they're probably going to see tree problems for probably the next couple of years. Okay. I noticed today that you sent out uh, with your newsletter an extension extra. That's that right. talked about. Yeah, we, we have a new extension extra out there on flood what to do about flood damaged trees. And, uh, you know, Dakota Dunes particularly, uh, when it flooded over that area, a lot of large cottonwoods, a lot of diverse plant materials in there. And they're going to find that there's an awful lot of decline in there. So we did develop a, uh, a new uh, extension extra that covers what trees are most likely to be affected. And then also, just as important, what to do afterwards. Okay, very good. Well, I kind of realize that we've, well, I assume we've had, well, we've had a lot of moisture. Yeah. But a sign that would indicate that, driving up tonight, I was telling Chris, I saw two snapping turtles along the interstate that had been trying to cross the interstate. So and that's the first time I've ever seen that. I've seen other things alongside the road, but not snapping turtles. So. If they were swimming across the road, that would be a bad they, they, sign. Oh, you know? These are, you know, if they were swimming, it was very slow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Chris, what do you have for us today? Well, I uh, went out of town for uh, a couple days, and when I came back, I, of course, had a bunch of overripe strawberries in my garden, and and unfortunately was picking and found that I have a nice outbreak of botrytis or, or gray mold in my strawberry patch. Uh, we have a couple of pictures to show of some close-ups of the symptoms, but, but what you go in when you go to find is that you'll, you'll see these um, fruit just covered in this fuzzy gray uh, material, gray spores is what it is. Um, Yep, there's a picture up there. Um, this is going to happen in this rainy, wet weather. Um, ideal when the temperatures are 70 to 80 degrees. Um, you'll get these masses develop on the, the spores. Um, going to happen in these temperatures. 
definitely when you have dense foliage, thick foliage without airflow. There's another picture here that shows it without the, uh, the spores. You can see that where it's more green with just this dark lesion on it. Typically it'll start up on the stem end and then work its way down. Um, they'll enlarge very quickly though. And then the last photo there will show that the blooms or the um, young flowers or the very young fruit can be affected as well. And it will work its way up the pedestal into the plant. So you can see it in all four or all three ways. A um, couple things you can do about it. Look for resistant cultivars um, when you're planting. There are a few, not 100% resistance out there, but there are some resistant varieties. Of course, plant in a sunny, well-drained, good airflow situation. Um, one of the things, too, don't let your beds get all full and, and, and matted. You want to renovate those back to a foot every year to help you have better airflow. Um, mulch so there's no direct soil contact. And then keep the fruit harvested. Don't let it get over mature. Pick the, the cold fruit out of there. And, um, of course, there's preventative fungicides as well as a last resort. Or um, in a wet situation like this, you can do some preventative spraying to at least try to save the new blooms. Okay. Or put a sump pump out there. Yeah, that too. But, you know, when we get into hotter weather, this is going to naturally be suppressed a bit. But in the fall, you know, get the debris out of there as much as possible to reduce chance for next year. You mentioned renovation. Uh, what, what kind of process are you talking about as far as renovating that bed? Okay, well, in the, in the, this, with June bearing at least, in the, in the August season, time of year, when, uh, when it's done uh, producing fruit, you can go through and mow off the top of the, the leaves, to clean that up, and then you take that big matted bed and you can till it in so that it's a smaller row, about a foot across, and that'll help reduce disease for next year. Actually take out some of the older plants? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right. So weather related on this particular one as well. Pretty much, and the presence yeah. of the inoculum. Okay. So. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Connie, what do you have us for us in the pathology world? Well, I was looking at some rhubarb diseases. Um, this cool, wet spring, we're seeing some different leaf spots, and probably the biggest one is an ascochyta leaf spot. It's going to be a little red circle starting out, and then you'll see as it gets bigger, it'll turn to white. I've got a, a photo up there that kind of helps picture that. And as it progresses, it'll just coalesce and take out the whole leaf. And it might look like insect chewing. Um, there should be another picture there of it on a little bit smaller version. And basically, all you want to do is sanitation. You know, clean out those leaves. You can still eat the stalks. That's not going to hurt anything, but get the leaves out of there. Uh, the other disease I have is more of a, um, like an anthracnose type thing. And it'll melt them out just like that as it gets really bad because it, it just takes out the whole thing. And again, sanitation, you know, and then you want to fertilize too. In the spring when it's coming up, give them a good shot of fertilizer, uh, composted manure, something like that, and then maybe again about midsummer. Okay. Now, on these, would either one of these cause the death of the plant, or is it more cosmetic? It's mostly cosmetic. I, I wouldn't think it would stay wet that long to wipe out the entire thing. You know, and like I said, you can still eat the stalks if you've got the anthracnose leaf spot just because you're not going to eat the leaves anyway. You know, they're poisonous. So okay. so in the fall, you should probably remove those leaves? Remove you're saying? everything. How Sanitation. about during the growing season? Sanitation. Okay. Get rid of I them. Gonna say, if, I, if I would remove all of mine, I think I, I wouldn't know if I had any leaves left on, <laughs> on mine if I did that during the growing season. But Maybe you so. need to move them, get them where there's I more air so. circulation yes. then. <laughs> Thin them out a little bit. So. Yep. Thank you, Connie. Yeah. Mike, do we have any weeds growing with all this moisture? No, absolutely not. No, we're, we're all set for the year, so <laughs> good news. Uh, no, yeah, we're in the prime of weed emergence season. I mean, now they're emerging at the fastest point throughout the whole spring. So, yeah, they're going to be coming on like gangbusters. But there's some weeds out there that are just downright nasty, and they will actually sting you. And a good example of that is stinging nettle. And it's always surprising the number of people that send in this plant every year not knowing, what is this plant that's stinging me? Uh, those little tiny thorns on the stems are filled with a kind of a chemical cocktail that causes that stinging sensation uh, when you touch these plants. So stinging nettle, it's a perennial, so you can mow them and that sort of thing to control them, but they're going to come back, so it's going to be a multiple year type of thing to control them. But go after those stinging nettles now before they start seeding out. But there's also more nettles out there. In the next photograph, we'll see that there's a wood nettle. So if you're out in a forested area, uh, you know, a can with a heavy canopy, you might see wood nettles around, and they'll also sting. They're not quite as bad as a stinging nettle, but they'll still give you a little bit of that stinging sensation. So watch out when you're in the woods. 
for wood nettle. And there's also another common nettle species which you might see uh, in your flower beds and that sort of thing. Fortunately, this one does not sting, but uh, it's in the nettle family, Pennsylvania pellitory. That's coming on like gangbusters right now. It's a fragile, kind of a watery looking plant. Doesn't get very big, so it's not a big problem. But if you look out in your flower beds in those shady areas, you'll probably see some of this lurking around. Um, easy to pull, easy to just uh, hoe out. So Pennsylvania Peltori, another nettle species lurking out there. That could be kind of a nuisance. So a bunch of nettles, but watch out for stinging nettles as you're out and about uh, working in the garden and that sort of thing. Are these annuals, perennials, biannuals? Yeah, the stinging nettle is a perennial that spreads by rhizomes or underground roots, and so it'll get a real dense patch. And so even though you mow it off or spray it with something like 2,4-D, uh, it'll come back and you know maybe next year. But um, just keep at it, and eventually you can knock them out. But uh, also, uh, apparently, there's all sorts of information on the internet for eating them. Uh, apparently, when they're you know eight inches tall or so, go out and of course, put gloves on, clip off the tops, and if you boil them, they won't sting your mouth as you're heating them. So that's an important step. Uh, but apparently they taste very good, uh, making pastas and all sorts of things with uh, stinging nettle. So maybe it's uh, something you might want to keep around. But you got to cook it. Got to cook it yeah. and boil okay. it. That's right. All right. Critical. Do you have okay. to strain it? Uh, I think straining it. I think you do. Otherwise, it's kind of like licking your cat. You know? <laughs> but they do make a, a, a nettle tea as well. And so see, even... Earwalls. I can yeah. see it coming already. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I've not tried this. So the, the, be careful. Yeah. Be careful. Okay. So good. Thank you, panelists. And so we'll get right into our questions and answers session here. So the first one comes to us from uh, Sundance, it says... And how they, well, they want to know how to get rid of old lilacs. She has tried to dig them out even with a skid steer loader, and, uh, but they just keep, keep coming back. So between John and Mike? Well, I'll take the, the simple approach is just dig them out. I, I'm surprised when she says that. I've, I've taken out long rows as well. And if, with a little backhoe or that, you can get most of the root system out. So I'm surprised it's coming back, frankly. It's a relatively easy plant to dig out. Um, I would just tell her to maybe dig a little bit more. Uh, but I suppose there's something else she can do as long as there's no other plants nearby. What chemical yeah, right. approach like would we have? Yeah, thinking of Roundup. Uh, usually you'd, you'd want them to, you know, to regrow maybe a foot or so so they have some of that new lush growth and then spray it with something like Roundup and that, that ought to kill. It may try to make one more attempt at regrowing then you have to retreat it. But uh, yeah. yeah, Roundup is going to be. Maybe that's the best. Go out there, dig a little bit more, let them sucker up a bit and hit them with Roundup. And, okay. But yeah, that, sh that should take care of it. But eventually you're going to have to, you might have to dig out that stump anyway. So, Well, you know, the thing, it suckers, so it spreads. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I used a little backhoe to dig them, I mean, you had a cluster of roots about this big. Uh, and there's always little sprouts beyond it. But you know, I just cut those several times and they exhaust their food supply and disappear. So, so obviously there's some plant tissue or, min or parts that are still in the soil. And if they do come up, they'd be tender in the herbicide or around up. Yeah, if they are growing out in the yard, you know, just mowing them will that'll the, suppress it. those yeah. those lush suckers. Yeah. But uh, but on the on the main growth, you could spray with Roundup. I mean, you don't want to spray the Roundup in your yard and yeah. kill the, all the grass, but yeah. just on the main point, you could okay. do that. Uh, Newell, John, they planted two burr oaks. One died to the ground and it started to grow from the base. Uh, the other one, the top died out uh, and wants to be cut and, and wants to cut it off. Uh, can he cut off the dead tops and let them grow? Sure. Okay. With, with burr oak, you can, and it's an important difference because burr oak is grown from seed. If this were a colivar, for example, if they're planting a uh, autumn blaze maple or something like that, most of those plants are budded, and if they die to the ground, what comes back is really the rootstock, not the plant. But with bur oak, since it's grown from seed, what's suckering back up is going to still be a bur oak. What I would suggest is let everything grow this year, even if they get two or three shoots coming up. And on the dead top, if they get two or three shoots coming up, that's fine. Next spring after it breaks bud, then try to train it back to a single stem again. But I would wait until next spring when it breaks bud because, you know, they may be left with four tops come winter, but three of them die during the winter anyway, and so they're left with one. So wait till next spring and prune off the dead now, but wait till next spring to try to train the plant to a single leader again. And the tallest one will become the leader? Is that correct? That's usually your best bet, yeah. but I'd choose the one that's more in the center and straightest. Uh, Mike, new lawn, they've mowed it twice. Is it safe to spray for weeds? 
Well, yeah, generally not. Uh, the best approach is to kind of, you know, those new grass seedlings are fairly tender yet. Um, I think, you know, they, they, the limit is, you know, they look for five true leaves, but, you know, counting true leaves on that little grass can be kind of difficult. So uh, our standard recommendation is to wait until fall, really, before you start spraying anything. And I know it's tempting, but uh, the best thing to do is just keep mowing it, and eventually that grass will fill in and, and start choking out those weeds. But, yeah, the safest thing would be wait till fall to spray. Is, is there anything that you need to spray for now? Anyway, the reason I ask, Mike, is... This last couple of days, pictures and samples are just coming in with 2,4-D damage. And it, and it happens every June and July. It seems like people aren't spraying their lawn with 2,4-D and, you know, the trees are picking up a whiff of it. Is there any advantage to spraying now? Or is yeah, I mean, if it's a situation where they just seeded and the grasses are threatening, the, or the, the weeds are threatening the establishment of the grass, you know, in, a, in an extreme situation, I can see where somebody would get pretty nervous about it. But yeah, you're right, you know, you're spraying now, and all those, all those broadleaf herbicides, they, they vaporize, and those vapors will move around, and, and uh, Connie's been getting inundated uh, with some of these curled up tomatoes and potatoes that are from, you know, this drift. And so... Yeah, absolutely. If you can avoid the spraying, that's another good reason to do that. But mainly the grass safety, it, you know, it would be much better to wait till fall. Okay. This one comes from Baltic. They have some existing herbs, basil. It has a lot of perfectly round holes. Now, they don't describe how big the holes are, but they're wondering, would this be an insect, a snail, or even cold weather related, or perhaps a disease? Any thoughts? And I kind of open this up to the, the panel like here. An insect or slug. That'd be my guess too as a slug. I mean, that basil foliage is really thin and it's lush. something they would like, lush foliage yeah. and um, you know, basil, that'd be the, the one thing. The only other thing I've ever seen on basils is Japanese beetles. It's still probably a little early for that and we're just starting to get a population of those in South Dakota, but I wouldn't suspect that quite yet. So I would say with the cloudy, wet weather, okay. slugs. And uh, slug um, baits probably? Yeah, there's, there's different those. products okay. out there. There's a nice product you can use around pets, iron phosphate, um, you could try the beer traps. Um, there's other slug baits out there as well. So. Okay. Good. Uh, asparagus, and this one comes to us from Letcher. What is the correct way to harvest asparagus? Should it be cut off below the ground or just break it off where it's tender enough and uh, it's not tough to eat? Well, I, I have actually read different versions of what's out there, but I don't think it's that picky. Um, I've read that on, on research-based sites, you can just snap it off. Um, I've read to cut it right at the ground level. Um, with cutting, though, be sure you don't get wide with your cutting so you're not nicking the new spears coming up. Uh, that would be the big tip there, but cutting, snipping, and then near ground level is ideal. Okay. I kind of use that break-off tender concept. <laughs> that seems to work pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, potatoes, Rock Valley, Iowa here. Beetles, what is the best control for potato beetles? Uh, will sprays work with all the moisture and other other options out there for, I assume they're talking about the Colorado potato beetles. But. Right, um, I, I do know that the um, carbaryl is less effective than it used to be. Um, I believe it'd be permethrin um, that you could use our other products out there. But do scalp for them. Start looking on the underside of the leaves for the little bright orange eggs that are on the underside. You can even just scrape those off or watch for those little larvae to form and pick them off at first. Pick the first few beetles off and that'll, that'll take you a, a, uh, several weeks into the season before you'd have to really apply anything. Okay. Uh, Tyndall, Connie, apple trees. And this is specifically apple trees, but this is probably showing up in a number of different plants. Little red spots on the leaves, small cylinder, didn't think it looked like rust, however. What might it be and what can they do for that? And this would be apple trees. On apple this scab? Well, or no. I'm going back to the rust still. The way, how'd they describe that again? It is small, circular, uh, and that's really how all the further red yeah. spots. Well, reddish, me, yellow, I suppose, yellow. Yeah, reddish, yellow spots. I mean, circular spots. That, that really is the rust, and I'm just beginning to see that oh, now. Yeah. Okay. The apple scab should be kind of an olive drab or olive green irregular blotch, mm -hmm. and we've been seeing that for the last couple of weeks. Uh, right now is when I'm just starting to see the uh, little bit of the cedar apple rust because it was just, uh, it's just recently that we were getting, the, getting on the cedar. So. Mm -hmm. My guess is they're probably looking at that, and I think it's going to be a bad year for it. Obviously, with most of our foliar diseases, once you see it, it's too late to do anything about it. The control for that, as well as apple scab, starts when the bud's expanding. So anything they do now is just because they enjoy going out spraying.
mm. not because they really want to have any effective control. Life threatening to the tree or? I was I'm glad you mentioned a tree or person. No, <laughs> it will not infect the homeowner. Uh, no, it won't won't kill the tree, but it might make it look so bad by August you wish it would die. Uh, they'll, I've seen it defoliate trees in bad years, and I think this is going to be a bad year if it's if it keeps staying this wet. So. Often with, uh, for apple scab, if you hold the leaf up kind of to the sky, you can see that very shading of dark and light. That, uh, whereas a, a normally kind of a normal shade, all same shade all the way across the leaf. But, yeah, they get a little transparent. Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. Uh, another asparagus question here. This one goes back over here to Mike, though, uh, from Corona. Can you spray the ground in and around the spray, asparagus with weed uh, weed killers without killing it? now that it is done producing yeah uh, <clears throat> yeah the question is uh sure you can uh, you just have to be very careful you know you, they'll be sensitive to your broadleaf herbicides you know sometimes we think asparagus is kind of like a grass but it's really a broadleaf and so it can be sensitive to those broadleaf herbicides so be very careful to avoid drift but i did that recently uh to get the canna thistle out of my asparagus and so uh, you can do that with a broadleaf herbicide or even glyphosate, but again, you have to be very careful. You might even want to put barriers around, you know, between the weeds and the asparagus and take your time. But it can be done. It's risky, so you have to be careful. Okay. Another one while you're on that, uh, Mike, from Canova is, uh, what can we she spray around her trees and flowers that won't kill them? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> around your trees and your flowers. Yeah. Water. Well, yeah. Uh, flowers are tricky in that you just there's just not really anything there um, uh, around. I'm trying to yeah flowers uh, you know broadleaf herbicides will be very sensitive to those flowers and so and trees uh, you know I guess it depends on on really what you're going after you know if it's a if it's an older tree you can always spray a little glyphosate or Roundup around the base of it. Uh, to minimize some some weed pressure there, but a younger tree you have to watch out if it has a thin bark. The the glyphosate could be absorbed into the bark. And, and what we always say is, if the bark's still green, I mean it's still photosynthesizing. Mm -hmm. In young trees, you'll have that. Don't spray. I mean we'll see. One of the, one of the things I see is you'll get a split along that green stem uh, from any of those applications. So I guess my biggest question is, what is she spraying for? Yeah, yeah, and that's a big thing. Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. that makes a big difference. Because, you know, sometimes, you know, we get some of these real tough perennial weeds, you know, like hand of thistle and things like that, and people, you know, what do I spare on my trees to kill these things? Especially newer trees. Well, you know, one common trick is to wait until fall, real late fall, when the leaves fall off, or at least they're, they're well turned. Uh, then you can get in there with maybe like a 2,4-D type of thing or something like that. But uh, right now, with those tender leaves out, it's pretty tough. Yeah, I think right now, I mean, I, I went into my raspberries, for example, and while it was a lot of fun, I just hand-pulled thistles and that out that were coming up until my plants were big enough to help shade it out because I didn't want to go in there and start spraying anything at this time of year. I mean, it took me a little time, but sometimes just hand-digging or pulling is your best bet. Yeah, it sure is frustrating. It'd be nice to just, you know, spray something and have them be gone, but it's not that easy. Yeah. Uh, they mentioned around trees. John, could you just share roughly so people understand how far the roots go out around the tree? Well, I explain that to everybody who yeah. applies Tordon in their ditch and, and is surprised the tree dies. Uh, general, uh, general rules, the tr roots go out as far as the tree is tall. There's nothing magical about the edge of the canopy, which you'll often find on labels, stay outside the drip line. But if you really want to be certain, you want to stay at a distance further than the tree is tall. But even there with some of our herbicides, they're very easily carried in water, which we have plenty of right now. And so I think Tordon's one of those that's picked up in water fairly easily and moved. Uh, yeah, you yeah. bet. And, and it's good to mention the, the Tordon thing because uh, even at you know some of the you know, your common hardware stores, I've seen, you know, bottles of Tordon being sold right next to the Weed Be Gone or, or whatever. And so, uh, you know, you, you, Tordon is, is one that you definitely don't want to spray anywhere near a tree because that, you know, that would kill, that could potentially kill the tree. And we're not talking just injury. So, uh, yeah, so you want to watch out for some of those. Just stick to the lawn type herbicides. Don't get into the pasture herbicides around the house. Okay. Yeah. Unless you want a pasture. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You'll have a pasture. So. Uh, Chris, from here on, radishes and cucumbers, kind of a two-part question. We'll start with the first part. Radishes, lots of tops, not much for bulbs, though, however. What should she do about that, or can she do anything about that? Can't do much about it. Maybe a couple things could be going on. Um, the heat can do that. Um, too much nitrogen can do that. 
So if you have been doing a lot of fertilizing, back off. Uh, don't add anything this year. Try again in the fall, you know, or late summer as we start to cool down. Radishes don't take at all a long period of time. The other thing, though, you could try if you want to grow more now is, is uh, maybe put a new patch out with some shade cloth over the top um, to avoid some of the heat and light. Um, that might help as well. Or grow them in the shadow of a taller plant. Okay. Uh, the cucumbers, uh, they've planted them. They've grown well. Uh, however, they have a lot of blooms, but they're really not setting much fruit. Any reason why? Okay. Um, the wet weather um, can cause that. A uh, couple things, though, to keep in mind, too. The, the male flowers will come first, so you won't see those female flowers right away. But if you are seeing female flowers, that's the one with the immature cucumber attached, you may not have the pollinators, again, due to possibly the weather. Um, so if the pollinators aren't doing the pollination, then you're not going to get any fruit to mature either. So a couple different things could be going on there. Okay. Just wait and see. And... Um, if you know you're getting female plants, you could go out with a little paintbrush and do your own pollinating. This one comes uh, to us from Watertown. <clears throat> and and I, I, I don't know if they measured this or whatever, but they said one sixteenth inch of tomato plant is turning white. What could it be? They have had five really hot days. Could it be the sun that is causing this damage? So The foliage is becoming white. It says one sixteenth inch of the tomato plant is turning white, and I, we could assume the foliage or the edge, edge, the yeah, edge of the leaves probably. They'll get a sunburn like that and turn white, but is it just on the edge of the leaf? And are they pretty young, tender plants? Because usually once they're a little older and mature, been out a while, they don't sunburn like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So without knowing a little more information, I think that one's a tough one to the to give a good would, answer. A picture would help. Yeah, yeah. A picture would be very good. And they also indicated uh, that they had five really hot days. Um, and perhaps they could think back to see when this showed up, if it was shortly after those hot days or exactly. prior to the hot days, that, that may help. But maybe a little more information could help on, on that particular one to get answered a little better. So, Okay. Uh, here we go. What can we do for grubs in the vegetable garden? You want to take that one, Chris, too? Or? Yep. Um, I mean, again, mm. anything you can do to increase airflow and sunlight to get rid of the moisture mm. is a good thing. Um, but, you know, a, a real nice organic approach would be to put out a beer trap. Um, you can put a little container partway into the ground and pop holes in the side and put a lid on it. That'll keep the dogs out of it. And um, <laughs> the slugs will crawl in through those holes and drown in the beer. If you don't want to use beer, you can use uh, yeast and sugar and, and water. Well, these are grubs. Oh, grubs. I'm yep. sorry. Slugs. Yep. I was yep. thinking yep. slugs. Uh, uh, grubs in the garden. Um, there's products on the shelf for grubs to use in the garden. Um, it's carbaryl. Is that one you can use in there? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, carbaryl, I think, works in the, in the vegetable garden as well. So that's in the ground. The grubs, of course, they don't emerge out of the ground. They'll eat out your root crop and different things there. So, so mainly if they go to, to buy a product, just make sure whatever's it's listed on the label for that And then, product. of course, always follow the directions there yep. because it'll have a reentry, possibly interval, or a harvest interval before you can eat that crop. Okay. Uh, the second part of that was garter snakes. How did they get rid of garter snakes? The environment is a big thing. They, they like to hang out in wood piles or areas that are grassy or there's piles of debris in your yard so you can clean up some of those things. It might help. Get a chicken. Get a kid. <laughs> chicken, kids, Relocate. same thing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Go through the yard. Well, I understand if you have garter snakes, then you don't have mice. So. Well, you have holes in which the is mice. which. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, John Ball, this comes to us from uh, Lincoln County, they said. Planted a service berry tree, 15 feet tall. Leaves are turning bright orange and red and dropping. No insects or spores that they can see. Any idea what this might be? Actually, there's a number of foliar diseases that occur with service berry. In fact, I got a few samples in today. And the, the symptoms they describe, leaves turning yellow and red, are, are fairly common. There's a couple of diseases very sim similar to apple scab. There's also some that are similar to cedar apple rust, but occur on the... Uh, on the service berries, they actually have they have actually have a lot more problems than people realize. I do like the plants, but on wet years like this, those are fairly common symptoms. I could show you some on a tree just outside the uh, the building here. So they say, well, I haven't seen it before. Well, most of us haven't seen quite this much rain before in terms of continual wet weather. Nothing they can do about it now. It wouldn't surprise me if that plant defoliates quite a bit by midsummer. Hopefully next year the weather will turn normal, whatever that is for South Dakota. A little drier in the spring, please, and they probably won't see the problem again. Okay. So nothing to do about it, but 
they may not get a lot of fruit or fall color. All right. So, good. Thank you, John. Well, earlier this year, Gardline traveled to Rapid City to learn about propagating plants. Rick Abrahamson, Pennington County Extension Horticulture Educator, demonstrated several different propagating techniques. This week, he learned how we will learn how to use cuttings to propagate plants. Now I'd like to demonstrate uh, cutting propagation. Cuttings are done uh, when you need to clonally reproduce the plant. So you want, you're basically going to end up with the same plant as you start with. Whereas when we use seed, we get a lot of variability in there. When we use asexual propagation techniques, it's, it's exactly the same. What I've got here is some rose cutting material we took. And you can see that this is sprouting already. And that's, that's really not optimal. It's actually better if it's totally dormant. But in the case of this rose, it should work fine. We're going to want to make cuttings of at least two nodes. And nodes are the, the places where the leaves and the buds and the stems are coming off of that cane. So we're going to do a cutting of at least two nodes. So I'm going to cut right below this first node. And I'm actually going to snip this stuff off because I don't want any foliage under the soil surface when I'm all done. We count up here's a node, here's a node, here's a node. I'm going to do about five nodes here because I want a cutting that's at least three, four, five inches. We take our cutting like that. Now it's very important that we keep them all the same direction because if we, if we stick that upside down, it's not going to work. It needs to be the right side up. The plant knows what's, which way is up. So if you do a lot of cuttings, you want to make sure you carefully uh, make sure you carefully set them down so that they're all the same direction. And a lot of people, what they'll do is they'll do an a angled cut on the bottom because that'll tell them what end, is, what end is down. So there's a good tip if you cut an angled end on the bottom and a straight cut on the top. Then we're going to take our cuttings and we're going to do what we call a quick dip in hormone powder. And this is a 0.3 IBA powder. You can, you can purchase uh, IBA powder at many garden centers. It's usually known as Raton. But we're going to dip it in water first. We're going to count about three, four seconds. One, two, three, four. Shake off the excess water and just dip it in the powder and shake, shake off the excess powder. Then we're going to stick it in the media just like that. So we can see we can do that with several of these. And you can do a whole lot of cuttings in one cell like that or a flat or even a small pot. You could do a whole lot of cuttings. Over here we see some cuttings that I've done a few weeks ago. They're already starting to sprout. This one here even has a flower. Now we want to remove that flower because we don't want them to flower. So you can just pinch that off if you see any flowers coming because flowering takes a lot of energy from the plant and we need to put energy into root production because all these cuttings, there's no roots. They have to make all those roots from what we call adventitious rooting. You can see the different things that I've done here. thank Rick for that information. It's always fascinating to see the different ways that we can reproduce plants other than seed and, and so on. So, uh, As always, we always have encourage our viewers to send in questions uh, by email or surface mail. And uh, one of them that came in, John, was related to the pine beetles out at the Rapid City or the hills. Do you want to enlighten us a little bit about that? They just wanted to know more about it. So. Sure. Well, anyone that drives out in the Black Hills now can certainly see the activity of the mountain pine beetle. A lot of the trees that were attacked last fall and are dead are now expressing that. They're turning red already. And so in, an, in about another month, the beetles will start flying out of those trees and attack new hosts. Typically, mountain pine beetle attacks trees within about 300 feet of where they emerge, though longer distances are possible. And if you've got a couple of high value trees, for example, you're on the Rapid City area, you have a cabin, and there's a few trees you really want to protect, now is the time to spray. We want to make sure that the application is on, 
by about uh, the end of June, so you're well ahead of the flight period, because if you spray after they fly and are already attacking a tree, you're too late. So if some people out there say, you know, I haven't sprayed yet, you probably have about a week or so to make sure your trees are sprayed. And if you're going to spray, it has to be carbaryl or permethrin, and it has to be a bark beetle formula, so it'll adhere to the bark well. The other thing is you need to spray up the tree until the diameter is about four inches, right from the base to one's four inches. So if you've got a large tree, and those are the ones you want to protect typically, you might have to get 30, 40, 50 feet in the air. And to do that, you better have a sprayer that at least has 200 PSI, if not 300. My favorite was the guy who was going to stand on ladders with a, with a hose-end sprayer. No, nah, you're not going to be able to do it. And you have to spray till runoff, not just miss the trunk. The other thing is there's nothing you can spray that'll keep the beetles from coming out. The only thing you do is spray to keep the beetles from getting in. So the trees that are already hit, there's nothing you're going to do to keep them from coming out. But the trees that you want to protect, you need to spray those now. And the other thing I might mention is you can find out there for sale what's called beetle blockers. It's a little uh, pouch you put on the tree, and it's supposed to repel the beetles. It won't. Uh, so really the only thing that works to protect a tree out there, a high valley tree in your yard, is to get out there and, and have it sprayed, I would recommend, rather than spray it yourself. There's a number of companies out there that, that can do it and do a very good job for you. If they do it themselves, the product you referred to is fairly common for them to purchase? No, it's not fairly common for okay. them to purchase. It, 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 I mean, Carboril is, but most of the time you go into a hardware store, it's for your garden, you know, seven or something like that. But there, there are a couple of stores out in the Black Hills that will carry it. You're not going to find it you're typically your, your lawn and garden sections. But there are a couple of companies out there that kind of specialize in, in these chemicals. But be certain that whatever chemical you buy that's carbaryl or permethrin, that it's labeled for bark beetles because you do need something that will adhere to the bark. How big are these beetles? Uh, the beetles are uh, about the size of a head of a match. And so you might say, how does something that little kill a tree? Well, they don't do it alone. Uh, you know, they'll attack the tree by the hundreds, and they, they literally mass attack. They wait and gang up on it. And they'll all attack at once, more or less. Uh, the tree will try to pitch them out. That's why you get all these globs of pitches on it. The tree usually doesn't win. Once the beetles are inside, they have lots of little beetles, and then they'll come out literally by the hundreds the following year. Once they're in the tree, story's done. Uh, that tree is going to die. It just doesn't know it yet. Now it knows it because they're turning red. Okay. Is there any special uses for that wood? Or I assume they, they cut the damaged dead trees out if possible? Or Well, that would make sense is for two reasons. If you can cut down an infested tree and use it for something, well, now it's not going to have beetles emerge the next year. So harvesting infested trees absolutely makes sense because now you've got something you can turn into a, a product. Uh, unfortunately, that wood gets blue stained. And sometimes that reduces the market. Now, interesting enough, the blue stain is just a color. It really doesn't affect the wood quality, but most people are so frightened of something, they think it's mold and they don't want it. But back in the 70s, you used to pay extra for blue stain paneling. People, people wanted it with the blue stain in it. And now someone over in, in Wyoming is marketing it as denim pine, which I thought was pretty interesting. And also, but yeah, the sooner they can get in there and harvest it, the less blue staining that occurs in the wood. And, and you'll find the mills out there have been very aggressively harvesting uh, infested trees this winter. Uh, again, that cuts down a number of beetles that are going to emerge and provides a useful product too. Now, would that be the same as the elm wood? Do they need to remove that bark if they're not going to lumber it or cut it into lumber? Or right. Just sit there? Or? Yeah, because it lives just beneath the bark, okay. and so that's the thing. If you've got a standing dead tree right now uh, that was infested this last fall, you have a mothership. You're going to have hundreds of beetles emerge from it. At this late date, there's not a lot you can do, but if you could get it on the ground and strip all the bark off, that might help. The problem is they're getting almost to the pupil stage, and at that point, even stripping the bark may not do it. It'll, it'll get a little bit more mice predation in that, but... you got to burn that bark, is you, what you're saying? Well, or or you, you just peel it off? Boy, if you could peel it off and, and burn the tree, the pieces of wood, mm -hmm. uh, obviously with a permit, that would help. Okay. The real point is you're almost too late to do anything with the standing infested trees, but you're right on time to do something with the trees that aren't infested, those yeah. high-value trees in your yard, right. if you're near an infestation. Right. 
Thank you, John, for that John, information. You know, one thing I've noticed too is we're getting calls in Sioux Falls about this. Yep. People thinking. So that's they don't need to worry, right, in Sioux Falls? Not unless I bring back a couple of chunks of wood next week. No, it's, uh, and you're right, Chris. I, I get calls all the time. People say, well, I, I hear about this big mountain pine beetle outbreak out there. It is in the Black Hills, uh, you know, and it literally is in the Black Hills. In Custer, it's up a little on Skyline, and there's a few trees, excuse me, in Rapid along there. And it is along some of the communities out there. But you get out to uh, Box Elder, you know, Wall, Murdo, no. Um, you don't have to worry, and certainly at this end of the state, we've got pine problems, Zimmerman pine moth, but we don't have to worry about mountain pine beetles. So yeah, no need to treat your trees at this end of the state. Okay. Very good. Well, uh, another question that came in, and this is about dark purple crocuses. Do uh, these types of crocuses grow in South Dakota, Macquarie Gardens, and so on? And I believe we got a, a visual there of a. They saw one on the cover of actually the College of Ag and Biosciences uh, magazine here. So, yeah. Well, what these are are actually our, our pask flower. Um, the native pask there is on the right, um, and the native pasks don't tend to be dark purple. They tend to be that lighter lavender color. On the other side of the screen there is a European kind of cultivated pask variety, and that's where you can get that nice dark purple color. Now, if they're talking about crocus crocus, you know, the bulb crocus, um, of course there's some dark colored purple varieties of, of those crocuses and you could be putting those in in the fall to the plant for next year. All right, good, thank you. Uh, this one, John, comes to us from Sioux Falls. They have a beautiful large locust tree in their front yard, north side of their house. They've lived there 10 years. However, in the last uh, year or two, the tree has They've noticed a lot of small dead branches starting to show up throughout the tree. Overall, it seems for, uh, healthy, uh, but with more of these branches starting to show up, it's becoming a little more noticeable. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Where are they again? Sioux Falls. Ooh, well, I wouldn't expect to see any tip die back on it. And this is a locust, they said. Mm -hmm. Honey locust, I'm assuming? I would assume that, yes. Okay, ooh, yeah, that is quite a dead branch. You know, one of the problems we do get with uh, locusts is we do get a little bit of winter kill. This winter was a very good year for winter kill. And it's just enough that kills little tips and that. And we can actually get a nectaria canker in there as well, and a thionectaria canker. And sometimes it's just little branch killers or tip killers. That is a problem with honey locust in the state. You know, if someone says, I like honey locust, I'd really like to plant one, because it does have light shade. You can grow grass underneath it. Uh, you don't have to rake it up. It has such a small leaf. The one I'd really recommend is Northern Acclaim. It was developed from North Dakota State University, and it's a very, very hardy honey locust and doesn't seem to be having the same problems as many of the others. So not much help for these folks. You just have to prune out the dead branches, which may occasionally occur. But if someone's saying, you know, I'm looking to plant a honey locust, one they may want to consider is called Northern Acclaim. Okay. Now these here look like some kind of major branches where it's fairly noticeable. But it's not uncommon when you're up looking inside the tree to see a lot of smaller branches, no leaves on. Right, and, and with honey locusts too, I'll, I'll bet if they look right at the crotch where that branch connects with the trunk, they may notice a little shrunken area there, and that's where the canker often develops. And usually the start of the canker is related to a little bit of winter injury. And, and again, the, the best management for that is prune it. Now, you can keep them around forever. I've had trees on campus that I've had to prune this out for 15 years, the trees are fine, they look nice, but it's almost an annual event to go in there and prune off what's killed. Okay. Uh, the next one comes to us from Rapid City, and they sent a, a nice little picture in of a three-foot-high hedge that's indicating some sort of disease, brown spots. The problem is isolated to a small area with no indication of it spreading. Could you give me some advice on what it is, perhaps the cause, and, and a treatment? It is located near Rapid Creek on the west side of Rapid City. Also, could you tell me what type of bush it is by chance by looking at that? So. You bet we can. Okay. We're garden line panels. <laughs> We're the experts of knowing and growing. Uh, this plant that you're seeing here is, uh, is uh, common buckthorn, which uh, is really a weed uh, that was planted as hedge materials back about 100 years ago. It's one of those things we wish people hadn't planted about 100 years ago, thank you. In some states, you'd have to rip out what you've planted there. This state, no, you can keep it. But, uh, and again, I see it more West River than East River as a hedge, but you'll find it. What it has is crown rust on it, which is a very common disease as well. It, unfortunately, the crown rust will not kill the plant. 
Uh, if it did, uh, it would be fine. But what it does is it spreads the cereal crops. And so it's a minor problem on those. So the, the spotting, and we're getting a lot of samples in right now on, on buckthorn, is fairly common. It's not going to kill the plant. Um, but be aware you're not going to find any controls to treat it or to protect the plant because, frankly, nobody wants the plant to live. All right, so common buckthorn. Keep it if you got it, I guess. Uh, if it dies, that's a good thing. Okay. But this, it will not kill it, right? It will not. Yeah, I know. If, if it would kill it, we'd be money ahead. But, but you know what? There are some West River locations that I've been at where they've got a nice little buckthorn hedge, and they keep it sheared, and it looks nice. And frankly, the site's so tough, you could never get anything else to grow there. So they may be on, when they may be on one where they say, you know what? I, I can keep this alive. I'm going to. That's fine. But, yeah, nothing kills it, unfortunately. Okay. The next one comes to us also from Sioux Falls, Chris. I have a very shady area in my garden that never produces good vegetables. What they would like to do is uh, turn that into shade-tolerant flowers uh, that they could use for cutting throughout the summer and so on. Do you have some ideas and suggestions as far as shade-tolerant flowers they could put there and to replace the vegetables that at one time they were trying to grow? Well, you know, when you throw in that for cutting, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, a lot of the, the shade ones, they flower earlier, too. You know, um, lungwort is one that comes pretty early, followed by... Um, Bleeding hearts, you know, those are really pretty in the shade. Um, another one that would follow then would be like your still bee. All are nice and, and flower in the shade. I don't know how far in the summer they'll go for you. You know, get some foliage plants in there, though, too. They can look really ornamental, you know, the hostas and the ferns and different things. They can add some texture to your landscape. And Solomon's eel. Solomon's eel. Those okay, are nice shade yeah. plants, too. So um, that's a few. Anybody else? <laughs> the, the only thing I would say is, and it sounds like they're a garden there already, so it's a good start, but... One of the problems we often get when people say, I want to do a shade garden and intervening tall trees is go in there and rototill the heck out of it, damage all the tree roots, and a tree dies three years later, and now they have a sun garden. But uh, it sounds like they've got a vegetable garden in there already, so they're not probably going to damage any more roots. So but. Just use their trial and put that plant in and yeah, don't careful. till the rest of it. Yeah, don't okay. till the rest of it. Okay. And, yeah. Uh, the next one also comes to us from Sioux Falls. My lawn is 11 years old and is one of the better lawns in the neighborhood. It is fertilized, watered, and mowed regularly. This spring we had a thatch problem, so I aerated it and cut back on the fertilizer. The lawn is doing great. However, the problem is that there is a, about 150 spots throughout the yard. I, don't, I assume they maybe counted all these. Uh, <laughs> where the grass is darker, greener, thicker, and grows faster than the rest of the lawn. These spots are randomly situated and are around 12 to 18 inches across. Any idea what may be causing this and how do I get the rest of the lawn to, the, to do this as well? You know, we've got that same sort of spotting out in the pasture, but cattle are responsible for those bright green dots. <laughs> so, I don't know, get a bunch of Holsteins out there and <laughs> you might have it. Summer patch, necrotic ring spot, or you know some of them that that make spots. There's a lot of different fungal disease, but you know what it always comes back to is almost loving your lawn too much, yeah. um, too much fertilizer, maybe mowing at uh, at the wrong height, things like that. So um, you may need to get in there and, and correlate again this fall. You probably still have a thatch layer if you're getting those kinds of diseases. Yeah. Um, avoid evening watering. The rain, of course, doesn't help us uh, in this situation. Um, mow at about a what, three inch height um, for healthy and growth. Consistently, don't let it get taller than that, and then cut a whole bunch off. You only cut the top third, so. And, and watch their fertilizing. And yeah. Fertilize, you know, a fall fertilization, um, a spring fertilization. If you really want the green green lawn, maybe do a second application in the fall. The latest you really want to fertilize is June, though. You know, don't fertilize in July and August, and, and that'll help you maintain a healthier lawn that won't get these diseases. But watch that thatch layer. No more than a half inch. You know, and, and you see that so often. I mean, I, I, know when, I know some people in South Dakota, they really pride themselves on their lawn, and you can walk on it. And this would be a good taste. If they walk on it and it's spongy, mm -hmm. you know, the thatch layer is too thick. And so, you know, I think they may be loving this lawn to death, yeah, they like you say. They love it to death, okay. and that's yeah. a common, because they want it lush, they want it beautiful, but you really can love your lawn to death. Cause more problems than good, so... So continue to aerate it and, and back off a little. <laughs> back off on the fertilizer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, uh, this comes from Vermilion, 15-foot burr oak tree. Has marble-sized growths on it, and the yellow jackets really seem to like it. 
Well, yellow jackets made may just like the tree. I mean, they're yeah. they're they're out right now. But the marble size growths are one of the many oak galls that occur, and we have a number of them that form on the stem. We have a number that form on the leaves. Uh, these are caused by a small snippid wasp, a uh, number of different snippid wasps that actually, uh, as they're feeding, they cause that injury to the plant. While it doesn't look very pleasant, uh, it's really no worse than zits. Uh, you know, you're not going to die from zits. You're just going to look kind of bad for a while. Same thing here. As to which one they have, I don't know. I mean, I actually, one time on the show, I brought in a book. Someone, believe it or not, wrote a book on the galls of oaks. Now, there's someone who needed a life, but nevertheless, there's about, there's at least 200 different ones. Yeah, and you know what? I don't have them memorized. <laughs> but so, Did you read that book? I did. <laughs> I'm waiting for the movie now. <laughs> Starts out with apple gall. <laughs> but yeah, don't, don't worry about it. They occur. And, and don't be surprised if after a few years they don't see them. It's, they are very cyclical. They have about three years where, they're, where you'll see quite a bit of them on a plant, and then you won't for about another 10. Okay. Uh, this comes from Aberdeen, Chris. Tomato branches at the ground level. Can she trim those up? And if so, how far? Okay. Well, you're probably talking about the process we call as, as suckering or removing those suckers. Um, you do, especially below that first blossom, want to remove um, the, the, the growth that forms in between the leaf and the main stem. However, though, when they start getting big, that can be quite traumatic. So you want to try to get them when they're pencil size or smaller, and you just can snap them out of there while they're young and work your way up the plant. Okay. It'll help increase airflow and light. It's good for the plant. Yeah. But what if we, um, these are ground level, the branches. Right. Should, if they're on the ground, should they prune those yeah, off? Yeah, you know, do it on a cloudier day, I guess I would suggest. You know, ripping that off in the heat of the sunshine can be... Can be um, traumatic for the plant so maybe prune them off with a shear even so they don't rip the main stem if they've gotten that large okay. but you're right the foliage sitting on the ground is going to be more prone to getting disease all right this one comes to us from hot spring strawberries and pill bugs uh, they are ripening and need to know how to control them so they're not causing problems with the uh, the strawberries they say pill bugs, yeah. but it may be sap beetles is what I'm guessing they might be talking about yeah. as well. So. I mean, it's sap beetles. You pick them off, you know, try to get them right away. Don't let them sit and get over ripened. Um, I'm yeah. not aware of spraying, though. No, because you're, you're absolutely right. There, it's kind of like when we have it for raspberries. At that point, they're going for the over-ripened fruit. Mm -hmm. And what you really need to do is just go in there and harvest on a more frequent interval. We have nothing you can spray and harvest the next day. Uh, and so really our chemicals are out and, it, and it's just the fact that you're leaving the fruit on there till it ripens too much so getting out there and, and picking the fruit is the, is the key. Okay, uh, Split leaf birch, three inch in diameter, three to four years old, very healthy. Can she prune bottom branches for more clearance uh, and will they heal up okay and what will uh, that do to the pretty white bark by pruning off those lower branches. Oh, where does she live? This would be in St. O-N-G-A-E. Oh, yeah. Okay, I know where that is. I mean, you're, we're talking West River here, yeah. people. I drive through there. Uh, St. Ange. Yeah, right. right. Okay. If you drive fast, I mean, it's all of two minutes. But uh, there's a bar there. But uh, uh, there she's got a chance. If she were anywhere else, any East River, I'd say, you know what, enjoy your plant. It's going to be dead in about three more years. And the reason for that is it's one of the favorite foods of the bronze birch borer. And usually when they get about 10 years old, not the borer, but the tree, the cut leaf birch, uh, they're attacked and killed. But the nice thing is there's no birch near there. Mm -hmm. There's no trees near there, really. I mean, they've got some. And so actually I find some of these isolated trees and Martin and that actually they remain bore free and actually get bigger than what I've even seen out east just because they don't have the insect problem. So she may have that tree for quite some time. And surprisingly, it's well adapted to West River growing environment. The only thing I would suggest, though, is still because the bronze birch borer is flying at this time and it is attracted to fresh pruning cuts, is I would wait until this fall when it drops its leaves to prune. And I would only prune her birch during the dormant season. But yeah, pruning off the lower branches, as long as she doesn't remove more than a third, is not going to harm the plant. 
it'll make it, it will still allow that beautiful white bark to occur in, in Europe it's called the lady of the woods I mean it does have some of the prettiest white bark you can find it's just unfortunate in East River that the bronze birch borer typically kills them before they reach okay. 10 years old so Thank you, John. So isolation may be good in this case. So, yep. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for this evening. Just to let you know, Garden Line does repeat twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Digital Channel 3, also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Fridays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Check your lo local listings to find SDPBE Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now time to wrap up and thank our panel of experts. John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist, Chris DeRazzo, Minnehaha County Extension Horticulture Educator, Connie Tandy, SDSU Plant Diagnostic Lab, and Mike McNeen, Extension Weed Specialist. Thanks to our phone volunteers, the folks from the Minnehaha County Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling in. On behalf of the entire crew, have a good evening and happy gardening. Funding for Garden Line is provided in part by your membership and the Friends of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. And by Swiftel Communications.